This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Don Quixote, Volume One, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part Fifteen, Chapters Forty Two and Forty Three. Chapter Forty Two which treats of what further took place in the inn, and of several other things worth knowing. With these words the captive held his peace, and Don Fernando said to him, In truth, Captain, the manner in which you have related this remarkable adventure has been such as befitted the novelty and strangeness of the matter. The whole story is curious and uncommon, and abounds with incidents that fill the hearers with wonder and astonishment and so great is the pleasure we have found in listening to it, that we should be glad if it were to begin again, even though to-morrow were to find us still occupied with the same tale. And while he said this, Cardinio and the rest of them offered to be of service to him in any way that lay in their power, and in words and language so kindly and sincere, that the captain was much gratified by their good will. In particular, Don Fernando offered, if he would go back with him, to get his brother the Marquis to become godfather at the baptism of Zoreda, and on his own part to provide him with the means of making his appearance in his own country with the credit and comfort he was entitled to. For all this the captive returned thanks very courteously, although he would not accept any of their generous offers. By this time night closed in, and as it did, there came up to the inn a coach attended by some men on horseback, who demanded accommodation, to which the landlady replied, that there was not a hand's breadth of the whole inn unoccupied. Still, for all that, said one of those who had entered on horseback, room must be found for his lordship the judge here. At this name the landlady was taken aback, and said, Seigneur, the fact is, I have no beds. But if his lordship the judge carries one with him, as no doubt he does, let him come in and welcome, for my husband and I will give up our room to accommodate his worship. Very good, so be it, said the squire. But in the meantime a man had got out of the coach, whose dress indicated at a glance the office and post he held for the long robe, with ruffled sleeves that he wore, showed that he was, as his servant said, a judge of appeal. He led by the hand a young girl in a travelling dress, apparently about sixteen years of age, and of such a high-bred air, so beautiful and so graceful, that all were filled with admiration when she made her appearance. And but for having seen Dorothea, Lucinda, and Zoreda, who were there in the inn, they would have fancied that a beauty like that of this maiden's would have been hard to find. Don Quixote was present at the entrance of the judge with the young lady, and as soon as he saw him he said, "'Your worship may with confidence enter and take your ease in this castle, for though the accommodation be scanty and poor, there are no quarters so cramped or inconvenient that they cannot make room for arms and letters.' Above all, if arms and letters have beauty for a guide and leader, as letters represented by your worship have in this fair maiden, to whom not only ought castles to throw themselves open and yield themselves up, but rocks should rend themselves asunder, and mountains divide and bow themselves down to give her a reception. Enter your worship, I say, into this paradise, for here you will find stars and suns to accompany the heaven your worship brings with you, here you will find arms in their supreme excellence, and beauty in its highest perfection. The judge was struck with amazement at the language of Don Quixote, whom he scrutinized very carefully, no less astonished by his figure than by his talk. And before he could find words to answer him, he had a fresh surprise, when he saw opposite to him Lucinda, Dorothea, and Zoreda, who— having heard of the new guests and of the beauty of the young lady, had come to see her and welcome her. 
Don Fernando, Cardinio, and the curate, however, greeted him with a more intelligible and polished style. In short, the judge made his entrance in a state of bewilderment, as well with what he saw as what he heard, and the fair ladies of the inn gave the fair damsel a cordial welcome. On the whole he could perceive that all who were there were people of quality, but with the figure, countenance, and bearing of Don Quixote, he was at his wit's end, and all civilities having been exchanged, and the accommodation of the inn inquired into, it was settled, as it had been before settled, that all the women should retire to the garret that had already been mentioned, and that the men should remain outside as if to guard them. The judge, therefore, was very well pleased to allow his daughter, for such the damsel was, to go with the ladies, which she did very willingly, and with part of the host's narrow bed, and half of what the judge had brought with him, they made a more comfortable arrangement for the night than they had expected. The captive, whose heart had leaped within him the instant he saw the judge, telling him somehow that this was his brother, asked one of the servants who accompanied him what his name was, and whether he knew from what part of the country he came. The servant replied that he was called the licentiate Juan Perez de Viedma, and that he had heard it said he came from a village in the mountains of Leon. From this statement, and what he himself had seen, he felt convinced that this was his brother, who had adopted his letters by his father's advice and excited and rejoiced, he called Don Fernando and Cardinio and the curate aside, and told them how the matter stood, assuring them that the judge was his brother. The servant had further informed him that he was now going to the Indies, with the appointment of judge of the Supreme Court of Mexico, and he had learned likewise that the young lady was his daughter, whose mother had died in giving birth to her, and that he was very rich in consequence of the dowry left to him with the daughter. He asked their advice as to what means he should adopt to make himself known, or to ascertain beforehand whether, when he had made himself known, his brother, seeing him so poor, would be ashamed of him, or would receive him with a warm heart. "'Leave it to me to find out that,' said the curate, "'though there is no reason for supposing, Signor Capitan, that you will not be kindly received, because the worth and wisdom that your brother's bearing shows him to possess do not make it likely that he would have proved haughty or insensible, or that he would not know how to estimate the accidents of fortune at their proper value. Still, said the captain, I would not make myself known abruptly, but in some indirect way. I have told you already, said the curate, that I will manage it in a way to satisfy us all. By the time supper was ready, and they all took their seats at the table, except the captive, and the ladies who supped by themselves in their own room, in the middle of supper the curate said, "'I heard a comrade of your worship's name, Senor Judge, in Constantinople, where I was a captive for several years, and that same comrade was one of the stoutest soldiers and captains in the whole Spanish infantry.' "'but he had as large a share of misfortune as he had of gallantry and courage.' "'And how was the captain called, Seigneur? asked the judge. "'He was called Roy Perez de Vidme,' replied the curate. "'And he was born in a village in the mountains of Leon. "'And he mentioned a circumstance connected with his father and his brothers, "'which, had it not been told me by so truthful a man as he was, "'I should have set down as one of those fables the old women tell over the fire in winter.' for he said his father had divided his property among his three sons, and had addressed words of advice to them sounder than any of Cato's. But I can say this much, that the choice he made of going to the wars was attended with such success, that by his gallant conduct and courage, and without any help save his own merit, he rose in a few years to be captain of infantry, and to see himself on the high road, and in position to be given the command of a corps before long. But fortune was against him, for where he might have expected her favour, he lost it, and with it his liberty, on that glorious day when so many received theirs, at the Battle of Lepanto. 
I lost mine at the Galetta, and after a variety of adventures we found ourselves comrades at Constantinople. Thence he went to Algiers, where he met with one of the most extraordinary adventures that ever befell any one in the world. Here the curate went on to relate briefly his brother's adventure with Zoraida, to all which the judge gave such an attentive hearing that he never before had been so much of a hearer. The curate, however, only went so far as to describe how the Frenchman plundered those who were in the boat, and the poverty and distress in which his comrade and the fair moor were left, of whom he said he had not been able to learn what became of them, or whether they had reached Spain, or been carried to France by the Frenchman. The captain, standing a little to one side, was listening to all the curate said, and watching every movement of his brother, who, as soon as he perceived the curate had made an end to his story, gave a deep sigh, and said with his eyes full of tears, "'O oh, Seigneur, if you only knew what news you have given me, and how it comes home to me, making me show I have feel it with these tears that spring from my eyes in spite of all my worldly wisdom and self-restraint. That brave captain that you speak of is my eldest brother, who, being of a bolder and loftier mind than my other brother or myself, chose the honourable and worthy calling of arms, which was one of the three careers our father proposed to us, as your comrade mentioned in that fable you thought he was telling you. I followed that of letters, in which God and my own excitations have raised me to the position in which you see me. My second brother is in Peru, so wealthy that with what he has sent to my father and to me, he has fully repaid the portion he took with him, and has even furnished my father's hands with the means of gratifying his natural generosity, while I too have been enabled to pursue my studies in a more becoming and creditable fashion, and so to attain my present standing. My father is still alive, though dying with anxiety to hear of his eldest son, and you praise God unceasingly that death may not close his eyes until he has looked upon those of his son. But with regard to him what surprises me is, that having so much common sense as he had, he should have neglected to give any intelligence about himself, either in his troubles and sufferings, or in his prosperity. For if his father or any of us had known of his condition, he need not have waited for that miracle of the reed to obtain his ransom. But what now disquiets me is the uncertainty whether those Frenchmen may have restored him to liberty, or murdered him to hide the robbery. All this will make me continue my journey, not with the satisfaction in which I began it, but in the deepest melancholy and sadness. O oh, dear brother, that I only knew where thou art now, and I would hasten to seek thee out, and deliver thee from thy sufferings, though it were to cost me suffering myself. Oh, that I could bring news to our old father, that thou art alive, even wert thou in the deepest dungeon of Barbary, for his wealth and my brother's and mine would rescue thee thence. O oh, beautiful and generous Zoraida, that I could repay thy good goodness to a brother! that I could be present at the new birth of thy soul, and at thy bridal that would give us all such happiness. All this and more the judge uttered with such deep emotion, at the news he had received of his brother, that all who heard him shared in it, showing their sympathy with his sorrow. The curate, seeing then how well he had succeeded in carrying out his purpose, and the captain's wishes, and no desire to keep them unhappy any longer. So he rose from the table, and going to the room where Zoraida was, he took her by the hand, Lucinda, Dorothea, and the judge's daughter following her. The captain was waiting to see what the curate would do, when the latter, taking him with the other hand, advanced with both of them to where the judge and the other gentlemen were, and said, "'Let your tears cease to flow, Signor Judge.' and the wish of your heart be gratified as fully as you could desire, for you have before you your worthy brother and your good sister-in-law. He whom you see here is the Captain Vidme, and this is the fair Moor who has been so good to him. The Frenchmen I told you of have reduced them to the state of poverty you see, that you may show them the generosity of your kind heart. The Captain ran to embrace his brother, 
who placed both hands on his breast so as to have a good look at him, holding him a little way off, but as soon as he had fully recognized him, he clasped him in his arms so closely, shedding such tears of heartfelt joy, that most of those present could not but join in them. The words the brothers exchanged, the emotion they showed, can scarcely be imagined, I fancy, much less put down in writing. They told each other in a few words the events of their lives. They showed the true affection of brothers in all its strength. Then the judge embraced Zoraida, putting all he possessed at her disposal. Then he made his daughter embrace her, and the fair Christian and the lovely Moor drew fresh tears from every eye. And there was Don Quixote, observing all these strange proceedings attentively, without uttering a word, and attributing the whole to chimeras of nightly errantry. Then they agreed that the captain and Zoraida should return with his brother to Seville, and send news to his father of his having been delivered and found, so as to enable him to come and be present at the marriage and baptism of Zoraida, for it was impossible for the judge to put off his journey, as he was informed that in a month from that time the fleet was to sail from Seville for New Spain, and to miss the passage would have been a great inconvenience to him. In short, everybody was well pleased, and glad at the captive's good fortune. And as now almost two-thirds of the night were passed, they resolved to retire to rest for the remainder of it. Don Quixote offered to mount guard over the castle, lest they should be attacked by some giant, or other malevolent scoundrel, covetous of the great treasure of beauty the castle contained. Those who understood him returned him thanks for this service, and they gave the judge an account of his extraordinary humour, with which he was not a little amused. Sancho Panza alone was fuming at the lateness of the hour for retiring to rest, and he, of all, was the one that made himself most comfortable, as he stretched himself on the trappings of his ass, which, as will be told farther on, cost him so dear. The ladies, then having retired to their chamber, and the others having disposed themselves with as little discomfort as they could, Don Quixote sallied out of the inn to act as sentinel of the castle as he had promised. It happened, however, that a little before the approach of dawn, a voice so musical and sweet reached the ears of the ladies that it forced them all to listen attentively. But especially Dorothea, who had been awake, and by whose side Donna Clara de Vadme, for so the judge's daughter was called, lay sleeping. No one could imagine who it was that sang so sweetly, and the voice was unaccompanied by any instrument. At one moment it seemed to them as if the singer were in the courtyard, at another in the stable, and as they were all attention wondering, Cardinio came to the door and said, "'Listen, whoever is not asleep, and you will hear a muleteer's voice that enchants as it chants.' "'We are listening to it already, Signor,' said Dorothea, on which Cardinio went away, and Dorothea, giving all her attention to it, made out the words of the song to be these. Chapter 43 Wherein is related the pleasant story of the muleteer, together with other strange things that come to pass in the inn. Ah, me! Love's mariner am I, on love's deep ocean sailing. I know not where the haven lies, I dare not hope to gain it. One solitary distant star is all I have to guide me, a brighter orb than those of old that Polinarus lighted. And vaguely drifting am I born, I know not where it leads me. I fix my gaze on it alone, of all besides it heedless. But over cautious prudery, and coyness cold and cruel, when most I need it, these, like clouds, its longed-for light refuse me. Bright star, goal of my yearning eyes, as thou above me beamest. When thou shalt hide thee from my sight, I'll know that death is near me. The singer had got so far, when it struck Dorothea, 
that it was not fair to let Clara miss hearing such a sweet voice. So, shaking her from side to side, she woke her, saying, "'Forgive me, child, for waking thee, but I do so that thou mayest have the pleasure of hearing the best voice thou hast ever heard, perhaps in all thy life.' Clara awoke quite drowsy, and not understanding at the moment what Dorothea said, asked her what it was. She repeated what she had said, and Clara became attentive at once. But she had hardly heard two lines, as the singer continued, when a strange trembling seized her, as if she were suffering from a severe attack of quartine ague, and throwing her arms around Dorothea, she said, "'Ah, dear lady of my soul and my life, why did you wake me? The greatest kindness fortune could do me now would be to close my eyes and ears, so as neither to see or hear that unhappy musician.' "'What art thou talking about, child?' said Dorothea. "'Why, they say this singer is a muleteer.' "'Nay, he is the lord of many places,' replied Clara. "'And that one in my heart which he holds so firmly shall never be taken from him, "'unless he be willing to surrender it.' Dorothea was amazed at the ardent language of the girl, for it seemed to be far beyond such experience of life as her tender years gave promise of. So she said to her, "'You speak in a way that I cannot understand you, Signor Clara. "'Explain yourself more clearly, "'and tell me what it is that you are saying about hearts and places, "'and this musician whose voice has so moved you. "'But do not tell me anything now. "'I do not want to lose the pleasure I get from listening to the singer "'by giving my attention to your transports. "'For I perceive he is beginning to sing a new strain and a new air. "'Let him, in heaven's name!' returned Clara, and not to hear him she stopped both ears with her hands, at which Dorothea was again surprised, but turning her attention to the song she found that it ran in this fashion. Sweet hope, my stay, that onward to the goal of thy intent dost make thy way, heedless of hindrance or impediment. Have thou no fear, if at each step thou findest death is near." No victory, no joy of triumph does the faint heart know. Unblessed is he that a bold font to fortune dares not show. But soul and sense in bondage yieldeth up to indolence. If love he wears do dearly sell, his right must be contest. What gold compares with that whereon his stamp he hath impressed? And all men know what costeth little that we rate but low. Love, resolute, knows not the word impossibility. And though my suit be set by endless obstacles I see, yet no despair shall hold me bound to earth while heaven is there. Here the voice ceased, and Clara's sobs began afresh, all which excited Dorothea's curiosity to know what could be the cause of singing so sweet and weeping so bitter. So she again asked her what it was she was going to say before. On this, Clara, afraid that Lucinda might overhear her, winding her arms tightly round Dorothea, put her mouth so close to her ear that she could speak without fear of being heard by any one else, and said, "'This singer, dear Signora, is the son of a gentleman of Aragon, lord of two villages, who lives opposite my father's house at Madrid. And though my father had curtains to the windows of his house in winter, and lattice-work in summer, in some way, I know not how, this gentleman, who was pursuing his studies, saw me, or whether in church or elsewhere, I cannot tell, and, in fact, fell in love with me, and gave me to know it from the window of his house, with so many signs and tears, that I was forced to believe him, and even to love him, without knowing what it was he wanted of me. One of the signs he used to make me was to link one hand in the other, to show me he wished to marry me. And though I should have been glad, if that could be, being alone and motherless, I knew not whom to open my mind to, and so I left it as it was, showing him no favour, except when my father and his two were from home, to raise the curtain or the lattice a little, and let him see me plainly, at which he would show such delight that he seemed as if he were going mad. 
meanwhile the time for my father's departure arrived which he became aware of but not from me for i had never been able to tell him of it he fell sick of grief i believe and so the day we were going away i could not see him to take farewell of him were it only with the eyes but after we had been two days on the road on entering the posada of a village a day's journey from this i saw him at the inn's door in the dress of a muleteer and so well disguised that if i did not carry his image graven on my heart it would have been impossible for me to recognize him but i knew him and i was surprised and glad he watched me unsuspected by my father from whom he always hides himself when he crosses my path on the road or in the pesadas where we halt and as i know what he is and reflect that for love of me he makes this journey on foot in all this hardship i am ready to die of sorrow and where he sets foot there i set my eyes i know not with what object he has come or how he could have got away from his father who loves him beyond measure having no other heir and because he deserves it as you will perceive when you see him and moreover i can tell you all that he sings is out of his own head for i have heard them say he is a great scholar and poet and what is more every time i see him or hear him sing i tremble all over and am terrified lest my father should recognize him and come to know of our loves i have never spoken a word to him in my life and for all that i love him so that i could not live without him this dear signora is all i have to tell you about the musician whose voice has delighted you so much and from it alone you might easily perceive he is no muleteer but a lord of hearts and towns as i told you already say no more donna clara said dorothea at this at the same time kissing her a thousand times over say no more i tell you but wait till day comes when i trust in god to arrange this affair of yours so that it may have the happy ending such an innocent beginning deserves ah signora said donna clara what end can be hoped for when his father is of such lofty position and so wealthy that he would think i was not fit to be even a servant to his son much less wife and as to marrying without the knowledge of my father i would not do it for all the world i would not ask anything more than that this youth should go back and leave me perhaps with not seeing him and the long distance we shall have to travel the pain i suffer now may become easier though i dare say the remedy i propose will do me very little good i don't know how the devil this has come about or how this love i have for him got in i such a young girl and he such a mere boy for i very believe we are both of an age and i am not sixteen yet for i will be sixteen michaelmas day next my father says dorothea could not help laughing to hear how like a child donna clara spoke let us go to sleep now signora said she for the little of the night that i fancy is left to us god will soon send us daylight and we will set all to rights or it will go hard with me with this they fell asleep and deep silence reigned all through the inn the only persons not asleep were the landlady's daughter and her servant maritornus who knowing the weak point of don quixote's humour and that he was outside the inn mounting guard in armour and on horseback resolved the pair of them to play some trick upon him or at any rate to amuse themselves for a while by listening to his nonsense as it so happened there was not a window in the whole inn that looked outwards except a hole in the wall of a straw loft through which they used to throw out the straw at this hole the two demi damsels posted themselves and observed don quixote on his horse leaning on his pike and from time to time sending forth such deep and doleful sighs that he seemed to pluck up his soul by the roots with each of them and they could hear him too saying in a soft tender loving tone o oh, my lady dulcinea del toboso perfection of all beauty summit and crown of discretion treasure house of grace depository of virtue and finally ideal of all that is good honourable and delectable in this world 
what is thy grace doing now art thou perchance mindful of thy enslaved knight who of his own free will hath exposed himself to so great perils and all to serve thee give me tidings of her o luminary of the three faces perhaps at this moment envious of hers thou art regarding her either as she paces to and fro some gallery of her sumptuous palaces or leans over some balcony meditating how whilst preserving her purity and greatness she may mitigate the tortures this wretched heart of mine endures for her sake what glory should recompense my sufferings what repose my toil and lastly what death my life and what reward my services and thou o son thou art now doubtless harnessing thy steeds in haste to raise betimes and come forth to see my lady when thou seest her i entreat of thee to salute her on my behalf but have a care when thou shalt see her and salute her that thou kiss not her face for i shall be more jealous of thee than thou wert of that light-footed ingrate that made thee sweat and run so on the plains of thessaly or in the banks of the pennus for i do not exactly recollect where it was thou didst run on that occasion in thy jealousy and love don quixote had got so far in his pathetic speech when the landlady's daughter began to signal him saying senor come over here please at these signals and voice don quixote turned his head and saw by the light of the moon which then was in its full splendour that some one was calling to him from the hole in the wall which seemed to him to be a window and what is more with a gilt grating as rich castles such as he believed the inn to be or to have and it immediately suggested itself to his imagination that as on the former occasion the fair damsel the daughter of the lady of the castle overcome by love for him was once more endeavouring to win his affections and with this idea not to show himself discourteous or ungrateful he turned rothinanti's head and approached the hole and as he perceived the two wenches he said i pity you beauteous lady that you should have directed your thoughts of love to a quarter from whence it is impossible that such a return can be made to you as is due to your great merit and gentle birth for which you must not blame this unhappy knight errant whom love renders incapable of submission to any other than her whom the first moment his eyes beheld her he made absolute mistress of his soul forgive me noble lady and retire to your apartment and do not by any further declaration of your passion compel me to show myself more ungrateful and if of the love you bear me you should find that there is anything else in my power wherein i can gratify you provided it be not love itself demand it of me for i swear to you by that sweet absent enemy of mine to grant it this instant though it be that you require of me a lock of medusa's hair which was all snakes or even the very beams of the sun shut up in a vial my mistress wants nothing of that sort sir knight said mary tornes at this what then discreet dame is it that your mistress wants replied don quixote only one of your fair hands said maritoness to enable her to vent over it the great passion which has brought her to this loophole so much to the risk of her honour for if the lord her father had heard her the last slice he would cut off would be her ear i should like to see that tried said don quixote but he had better beware of that if he does not want to meet the most disastrous end that ever father in the world met for having laid hands on the tender limbs of a love-stricken daughter maritornes felt sure that don quixote would present the hand she had asked and making up her mind what to do she got down from the hole and went into the stable where she took the halter of sancho panza's ass and in all haste returned to the hole just as don quixote had planted himself standing on rothinanti's saddle in order to reach the grated window where he supposed the lovelorn damsel to be and giving her his hand he said lady take this hand or rather 
this scourge of the evil-doers of the earth. Take, I say, this hand which no other hand of woman has ever touched. Not even hers who has complete possession of my entire body. I present it to you, not that you may kiss it, but that you may observe the contexture of the sinews, the close network of the muscles, the breadth and capacity of the veins, and whence you may infer what must be the strength of the arm that has such a hand. That we shall see presently, said Maritones, and making a running knot on the halter, she passed it over his wrist, and coming down from the hole, tied the other end very firmly to the bolt of the door of the straw loft. Don Quixote, feeling the roughness of the rope on his wrist, exclaimed, "'Your grace seems to be grating rather than caressing my hand. "'Treat it not so harshly, for it is not to blame for the offence my resolution has given you. "'Nor is it just to wreck all your vengeance on so small a part. "'Remember that one who loves so well should not revenge herself so cruelly.' But there was nobody now to listen to these words of Don Quixote's. For as soon as Maritones had tied him, she and the other made off, ready to die with laughing, leaving him fastened in such a way that it was impossible for him to release himself. He was, as has been said, standing on Rothenanti, with his arm passed through the hole and his wrist tied to the bolt of the door, and in mighty fear and dread, of being left hanging by the arm if Rothanti were to stir one side or the other, so he did not dare to make the least movement. Although, from the patience and imperturbable disposition of Rothanti, he had good reason to expect that he would stand without budging for a whole century. Finding himself fast, then, and that the ladies had retired, he began to fancy that all this was done by enchantment as on the former occasion when, in that same castle, that enchanted moor of a carrier had belaboured him, and he cursed in his heart his own want of sense and judgment in venturing to enter the castle again, after having come off so badly the first time, it being a settled point with knight-errants, that when they have tried an adventure and have not succeeded in it, it is a sign that it is not reserved for them but for others and that therefore they need not try it again. Nevertheless, he pulled his arm to see if he could release himself, but it had been made so fast that all his efforts were in vain. It is true he pulled it gently, lest Rothenanti should move, but, try as he might to seat himself in the saddle, he had nothing for it but to stand upright or pull his hand off. Then it was he wished for the sword of Amadis, against which no enchantment, whatever, had any power. Then he cursed his ill fortune. Then he magnified to the loss the world was sustained by his absence, while he remained there enchanted. For that, he believed, was beyond all doubt. Then he once more took to thinking of his beloved Dulcinea del Toboso. Then he called to his worthy squire, Sancho Panza, who, buried in sleep, and stretched upon the pack-saddle of his ass, was oblivious at that moment of the mother that bore him. Then he called upon the sages Logandio and Alquif to come to his aid. Then he invoked his good friend Uganda to succour him, and then, at last, morning found him in such a state of desperation and perplexity that he was bellowing like a bull, for he had no hope the day would bring any relief to his suffering which he believed would last for ever, insomuch as he was enchanted. And of this he was convinced, by seeing that raw Thanante never stirred, much or little, and he felt persuaded that he and his horse were to remain in this state, without eating or drinking or sleeping, until the malign influence of the stars was overpassed, or until some other more sage enchanter should disenchant him but he was very much deceived in this conclusion. For daylight had hardly begun to appear, when there came up to the inn four men on horseback, well equipped and accoutred, with firelocks across their saddle-bows. They called out and knocked loudly at the gate of the inn, which was still shut. On seeing which, Don Quixote, even there where he was, 
did not forget to act as sentinel, and said in a loud and imperious tone, Knights or squires, or whatever ye be, ye have no right to knock at the gates of this castle, for it is plain enough that they who are within are either asleep, or else are not in the habit of throwing open the fortress until the sun's rays are spread over the whole surface of the earth. Withdraw to a distance, and wait till it is broad daylight, and then we shall see whether it will be proper or not to open to you. "'What the devil fortress or castle is this?' said one. "'To make us stand on such ceremony? If you are the innkeeper, bid them open to us. We are travellers, who only want to feed our horses and go on, for we are in haste.' "'Do you think, gentlemen, that I look like an innkeeper?' said Don Quixote. "'I don't know what you look like,' replied the other. "'But I know that you are talking nonsense when you call this inn a castle.' "'A castle it is,' returned Don Quixote. "'Nay, more. One of the best in this whole province. "'And it has within it people who have had the sceptre in their hand and the crown on their head.' "'It would be better if it were the other way,' said the traveller. "'the sceptre on the head, and the crown in the hand. "'But, if so, may be, there is within some company of players, "'with whom it is a common thing to have these crowns and sceptres you speak of, "'for in such a small inn as this, and where such silence is kept. "'I do not believe any people entitled to crowns and sceptres "'could have taken up their quarters.' "'You know but little of the world,' returned Don Quixote, "'since you are ignorant of what commonly occurs in knight errantry.' But the comrades of the spokesman, growing weary of the dialogue with Don Quixote, renewed their knocks with great vehemence. So much so that the host, and not only he, but everybody in the inn, awoke, and he got up to ask who knocked. It happened at this moment that one of the horses of the four who were seeking admittance went to smell Rothenanti, who, melancholy, dejected, and with drooping ears stood motionless, supporting his sorely stretched master. And as he was, after all flesh, though he looked as if he were made of wood, he could not help giving way, and in return smelling the one who had come to offer him attentions. But he had hardly moved at all, when Don Quixote lost his footing, and slipping off the saddle he would have come to the ground, but for being suspended by the arm, which caused him such agony that he believed either his wrist would be cut through, or his arm torn off, and he hung so near the ground that he could just touch it with his feet, which was all the worse for him, for, finding how little was wanted to enable him to plant his feet firmly, he struggled and stretched himself as much as he could to gain a footing, just like those who undergo the torture of the strapado when they are fixed at touch and no touch, who aggravate their own sufferings by their violent efforts to stretch themselves, deceived by the hope which makes them fancy that with a very little more they will reach the ground. End of part 15 Chapters 42 and 43